Wait, you helped your husband commit treason? Hi there, I'm Peyton Dixon of Historic Experience, and welcome to What the History, the extra copy of your proof of insurance, because your partner knew you would lose your copy in the bottom of the glove box of history. If you love history and all its brothers, sisters, and awkward cousins, then please like, comment, subscribe, and share. Let the YouTube algorithm know you care. So, Benedict Arnold. Most every history fan's favorite punching bag. Of course, some historians will tell you that his life pre-treason, like a Facebook relationship, is complicated. One of the supposed linchpins in Arnold's road to rebelling against the rebels was the it girl of 18th century Philadelphia, Margaret Shippen, or as she was known by her nickname, Peggy? You know, I've never fully understood how you get Peggy from Margaret. Sort of like how Hank is a name that means John. Anywho, Peggy gets portrayed as the Lady Macbeth of the Benedict Arnold story, or the sweet seductress who suckers poor Benny into a life of crime. But really? Peggy's life plays less like a period piece and more like a weird Hallmark movie. You say you want a revolution? She's got a revolution in love. Peggy Shippen, John Andre, and Benedict Arnold, starring in Betrayed by Love. This fall, Philadelphia is not just the city of brotherly love. We start with young Peggy, and by young I mean she was just 17. You know what I mean. In 1777, her dad, Edward, is a known and respected lawyer and judge in town. The family kinda stays neutral in the revolution, but is quietly pining for reconciliation with England. Which is helpful in September of that year, when the British come marching in. They've sent Washington and the Continental Army packing off for Valley Forge, and the British Army is looking for a place to stay during the long winter. And what better place to stick it to the Americans than Britain's lodging in the birthplace of independence? Peggy, like her sisters and many other young girls with loyalist and or neutral fathers, are kinda swooning over the many young and handsome lads in uniform. Peggy starts up a sort of flirtatious friendship with a major John Andre. Oh, this is Philadelphia, eh? Well, it's charming, in a rustic colonial sort of way. Oh, Johnny, Philadelphia has a lot to offer. <laughs> Perhaps you could show me the sight? <laughs> Andre soon discovers that Philly is an arts and culture district, a hip and happening scene on the banks of the Delaware. Andre fits right in with the dancing and the play watching and even the play acting and the ice sculpting at the Christmas Village. Okay, it's not that much of a Hallmark movie, but stay with me. The winter comes and slowly melts into spring when it starts becoming clear that this cannot be a long-term stay for the British Army, especially because supply lines are blocked by American forts and the British soldiers have just been kind of taking stuff from Philadelphians, like food and clothing and cattle and any wood that wasn't nailed down. Well, they'd take wood that was nailed down too. And that is not making the locals happy. But before they go, the head of the British Army and the head of the British Navy, General Sir William Howe and Admiral Richard Howe, respectively, were departing North America. AKA General got fired because he didn't get the job done and Admiral decided to resign along with him. Brothers. But these guys are loved by the troops and they decide that they should hold a big fancy fete. Fete, now a celebration or festival. In the words of John Andre, I do not believe there is upon record an instance of a commander in chief having so universally endeared himself to those under his command. It was resolved amongst us that we should give him as splendid an entertainment as the shortness of time and our present situation would allow us. And they went big! It was a spring miracle! On May 18th, 1778, 400 officers and loyalists attended the Meschianza! Some say it was Italian for medley. Some say it translates to mismatched. Seems like it was kind of both. A festival replete with, yeah, I could have said including, but if they're going fancy, so am I. A festival replete with a flotilla of barges sailing down the Delaware River, a flatboat carrying the band, officers dressed like French medieval knights, young ladies dressed in Turkish inspired dresses, even, quote, 24 black slaves in oriental dresses with silver collars and bracelets ranged in two lines. 
Mm -hmm. Ah, it wouldn't be a fit without some racial disparity, would it? There was a mock jousting competition, another procession, and an elaborate dinner in an elaborately elaborate tent. It's reported to have cost about 15,000 pounds sterling total. In today's dollars, at the time of this recording, that's over two and a half million dollars for a party to send off a general who hadn't won the war yet. And it was all designed by, yep, you guessed it, our first act hero, Major John Andre. He's even designed the costumes. So there's your young stranger saving the day part of the movie. Sort of. Although we have mixed messages as to whether or not Peggy even got to go to the Miscanza. Andre said she was there. Peggy's dad didn't really seem keen on her going, so maybe yes, maybe no. But a month later, the British army withdraws from Philadelphia, leaving the loyalists and neutrals like the Shippen family not sure whether to feel sad, worried, or relieved. Poor Peggy, she watches the soldiers leave, including her almost interest, Andre. And she's back to being a sad and confused 18-year-old. But not for long, because soon the Continental Congress is back in Philadelphia, yeah. and soon after, a military governor arrives to keep an eye on things. A young man named Benedict Arnold. Young is relative. Peggy turned 18 in 1778. Andre, at the time, is all around 26, so almost 10 years older. Nothing too unusual for the 18th century. When Arnold comes into town, he is 37 to Peggy's 18, over twice her age. Still not a deal breaker at the time. But he's a man with a reputation for his urging to take the British Fort Ticonderoga, which went well, and Quebec, which didn't. His leg is injured in that battle, and in the Battle of Saratoga, it gets injured again, and poorly set because he doesn't want it amputated. As a result, his left leg is consequently two inches shorter than his right. So a permanent reminder for the rest of his life in a limp. Although he did have a little insert into his shoe to make things a little bit better for him, but still. Arnold is not seen as much of the hero of Saratoga as he would like. He grows bitter. He gets passed over for promotion. Five times. He grows more bitter. Since he is wounded and can't really fight, Washington gives him a safer job as military governor in Philadelphia. Bitter, but he's got a job. And he mingles around with a number of families with varying loyalties, including the Shippens. Arnold meets Peggy in the Shippens drawing room. Oh, General, it's nice to get some time in private with you. <laughs> or is it a gala at Arnold's house? Oh, General, it's nice to get some time in private with you. Maybe the city tavern? Oh, General, it's nice to da, 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 da. It's not fully clear, but Benny is smitten right away, and this starts a breakneck saunter to the altar. Peggy seems to like Benny, but she's actually overwhelmed by his heroic fame. Daddy Edward, however, is not particularly moved by them marrying. Whether this wedding will take place or not depends on circumstances. If it should, it will not be until spring. It was a long winter. Not Valley Forge long, but long. Eventually, Peggy decides to marry Benny if her father approves, which he finally does, considering General Arnold to be a fine gentleman. And in spring of 1779, Peggy Shippen becomes Peggy Shippen Arnold. And Benedict... Well, he's still bitter. He's trying to make some extra money in Philly by buying up goods to mark up for army sale. But Congressman Joseph Reed of Philadelphia gets wind of this and puts an end to Arnold's scheme. There's a lot of twists and turns, but for movie's sake, Congress has General Washington formally reprimand Arnold for a couple of charges rather than dishonorable discharge, which Washington does. And Arnold becomes, survey says, <laughs> He blames Washington, he blames Reed, he blames this whole rebellion. And so Benny has a lot of bitterness, and we knows where it ultimately goes. Now again, this brings us to the possibility of Peggy Shippen Arnold's role in Benedict's betrayal. We don't know what she said to him, or how deep her loyalist roots were showing, but there was one thing we knew for sure. She knew a guy. John Andre has continued to serve in the British Army in New York, and may be the first Brit in America to be sent off to the friend zone by one Peggy Shippen. 
but they have not lost touch. So whether Benny has the idea or Peggy does, she initiates contact between her husband and Andre. She writes letters to Andre, which have secret messages on them, and that straightens the winding road that leads to West Point, the failed attack, the Benedict Arnold story we all know and loathe. And it's a frustrating story because Benedict Arnold gets away. Sure, his life's not showcase showroom fabulous afterwards, but he does get away with treason. And for her part, so does Peggy. When General Washington comes to the Arnold home, quite likely to confront Arnold over evidence of his actions, Peggy feigns hysteria and claims someone's trying to kill my baby. And they let her go. It's sad because they dismiss her as a poor, frail woman, but she uses it to advantage and gets away. Even when she's caught later in her lie, she's simply sent off to New York to join her traitorous husband because she obviously can't do anything else. And when Benny and Peggy travel to England, Peggy is set up with an annual pension of 500 pounds from King George III, about 85,000 of today's dollars at the time of this recording. And she receives an additional 350 pounds honorarium for her services, which were meritorious. Who's hysterical now? And that's how Peggy Shippen got involved in one of the most infamous cases of treason. What do you think? Is she more treacherous than she seems, or was she an innocent helping her husband? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share so that you and even more history fans get your history fix. And remember, if you learn from history, you can make better history. Oh, Peggy, my Peggy Shippen. Peggy, Peggy Shippen, queen of the social scene.